This is your coffee break. Hey friends, I'm back again this week and I'm super stoked to have with me author Ryan Dalton. He has written The Year of Lightning, and he has a brand new book coming out this April, The Black Tempest, and I'm super excited to invite him to today's show. So welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Happy to be here. I think, I don't know if you're my first young adult writer that I've had on the show. So this is super exciting, and it's it's such a huge genre, and I'm such a huge fan. I don't know how I've uh, made this oversight, but... Welcome. I would love to kick things off by just hearing a little bit about your story, how you became a writer. Sure. Um, well, I'm a giant nerd, so I started out <laughs> with loving things. <laughs> uh, you know, as a kid, I was, you know, I would eat up anything of like, you know, Transformers, Star Wars. The 1989 Batman was a real moment for me. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. The original, original 78 Superman movie. I just, I loved all that stuff. Um, and you know princess bride and things and so i i i I mean just i mean from the time i i knew what a book or a movie was i i loved them my parents were real big on reading so i had stacks of like hardy boys novels and uh i had a wrinkle in time at a a young age and um so i was exposed to all that stuff early and just there was never a question in my mind that that how, how much i loved it and uh, I early, early on, I would say, I don't know, seven or eight years old, I started writing little stories and little poems and just for, you know, just for fun. Um, but I, I loved it immediately. Um, and then at 10 or 11, uh, there was a family friend who uh, published a sci-fi book. And it, it blew my mind that I actually knew somebody who had a real book. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah. And I said it at, I think, yeah, 10 or 11, I was like, OK, that's going to be me someday. And uh, so I, you know, I, as I grew up, um, I still treated it more like a, a hobby than anything uh, until I was uh, in my late twenties. And then I realized, Hey, wait a minute, I could, I could do more with this. <laughs> and that's when I started really uh, working on the craft seriously and started, uh, you know, trying to get little jobs and actually do some pro work, uh, knowing that my ultimate goal was going to be to write novels um, but I didn't want to start right away until it felt like my, my skills were, were up to par. So I, I tried all sorts of stuff. Uh, I, you know, I did screenplay contests. I did uh, uh, freelance advertising work, uh, all sorts of stuff, just to get experience in all sorts of different types of writing. Meanwhile, I, I kept a notebook with just random ideas, whether you know character ideas or story ideas or, or just random things that would come to me. And... I think I was, I wrote for uh, about a year for a comedy blog. And as that was kind of coming to a close, I thought, you know, I think I'm, I'm ready to start. I went through all of my, my ideas in the notebook and I thought, okay, so which of the novel ideas here is going to, what grabs me the most, you know, what do I want to work on first? And I had probably a good 20 to 30 novel ideas (laughs) uh, and and the, the year of lightning stood out the most. You know, the, the core idea that ended up leading to the Year of Lightning is what intrigued me the most. I mean, it was one of the most different, and uh, I thought, you know, I think that could be something cool. And uh, two years later, I, I was finished it and started querying. Wow, two years. Yeah, two years. Uh, about a year and a half to finish the first draft, six months to do a few drafts after that. I had some really, really good beta readers that just had some, uh, some priceless uh, advice that that I think helped to make the book uh, a lot better and get it to the point where it sold. It sounds like you were working your way up to writing a novel, like a novel was this beautiful, holy thing. Has your, now that you've published one, has your perception of novels changed at all? Uh, You know, I, I I don't think so. Um, I I still love them just just the same. Um, The, the only difference now is when I read other people's novels, I can sometimes see a little bit of the, like what's going on behind the curtain to kind of set the scenes and set the stage. And, you know, when you, when you spend your days stringing all that stuff together, it's easier to see in in other books, but I I don't think it has lessened my enjoyment of them at all. I'm still every bit as enthusiastic when I find a good one. That's a, that's a good way to be. I think that in order to create something passionately and have it be good, you know, you have to be a little bit in love with it. You have to be really passionate about it. So that's yes, definitely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I don't see the point 
it, it, I mean, it's so much hard work. I don't see the point in doing it unless you absolutely are, are in love with doing it. You know, you talk about nerd culture, and I am also a huge nerd. Like, while you were talking about The Princess Bride and Star Wars and all of these things, I was like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I, I, that really resonates with me as well. I'm a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan and Firefly and all of these. Yes. Anything Whedon, you pretty much got me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I'm so interested in um, what makes nerd culture so powerful. And, and for me, it's always been the story and the characters. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how nerd culture led you to sort of write novels of your own. Uh, well, I, I think one of the best things about the nerd culture is the complete commitment and openness to loving what you love. Mm. Um, and and I, I see it more as the years progress, which is nice, because, you know, when I was a, a little kid in the 80s, it was, there was very much the whole uh, uh, stereotypical jock or geek type thing. And, uh, and the geeks were not in fashion at that point. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> but for, the, for those of us who loved it anyway, we never cared. You know, it, it wasn't going to dampen our, our, our love of comic books or movies or anything. And I, I think that's a big part of it. And that's one of the reasons that I like going and doing appearances at, at Comic Cons or um, at, you know, even just going, if, even if I'm not a guest. Because uh, it's just, you know, it's thousands on thousands of people that are just having a blast, loving what they love and sharing it with people. And that's one of the things that I love about it. I, I also think it's such a, a broad canvas. You can do so much with it. Mm-hmm. You can do things that are kind of fanciful wish fulfillments, or you can take on very serious stories kind of through the lens of something that's a little geekier. And I like it when something that is a little lighthearted also has these little powerful moments that are slipped into it. So, boy, you know, I guess I haven't taken too close a look at why I like nerd culture, but that's some of it. <laughs> I appreciate that. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's sometimes hard to kind of like look past the things that we love when we love them so, so much and so blatantly. And I've probably never even stopped to think about that myself. So maybe it's not fair of me to ask that of you. Um, Have you noticed any sort of uh, nerd culture surrounding your own works or any sort of following that that you've been able to maybe pass on to your readers? Uh, Little twinklings. I I mean, I'm I'm so new, but I've seen a a few little things. Um, my first book especially deals a lot, uh, has a lot of storms in it and talks a lot about lightning and, and how it happens. And uh, there's some crazy stuff with lightning that happens. And so when that book was out, uh, when it was, you know, kind of fresh last year, that I had a lot of people sending me online pictures of lightning storms. And, oh, cool. Yeah. And like creepy abandoned houses and things. And because uh, those are, you know, both figure prominently in the in the book. And, and I thought that was cool. I, I liked that they would be just kind of out about their day and they would see something like that and they would think of the book. I, I think that's really cool. And uh, I just recently, this is pretty flattering, had a, uh, a reader start a fan wiki about the series. What? Yeah, which was felt really cool. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, it's one of those where, it, you know, it, it was, wasn't at first a super wide release, so... You would first kind of fight tooth and nail for, you know, one reader and then the next reader and then the next reader. And before you know it, there are people that talk about it that you have never seen or met, which is cool because it means they found it independent of you. And so and I've gotten you know, a couple of emails from readers that were very complimentary. And um, yeah, it's it's all it's all gradual, but snowballing little by little, which is fun to watch. You know, that's you make a great point. I think that that's how success happens. You know, people look at us and they look at people who are famous and they say like, oh, they must have done this overnight. But there's years and years and years of hard work. I like that you use that snowball analogy because I think that's just so much more accurate than the way we tend to perceive it. So I love that you're on that road. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's very easy. And I'm sure I do it, too. But like you see someone who suddenly has something that has natural attention and you just you kind of think oh well this you know must have you know they must have finished it yesterday and now it's popular but, yep you know that it just doesn't really work that way um there's another writer named Kwame Alexander who writes a lot in verse and he's just ridiculously talented and he's got a really nice career now but when he started he couldn't get anyone to carry uh, or to, to publish his books because they said nobody's going to read books in verse and so he printed them himself and would put boxes in his car. He'd drive to different cities, sleep on friends' couches, and go anywhere he could to try to get, try to hand sell these books to people. Wow. So finally, he gets you know uh, after years of that, he gets you know big book deals. But yeah, he started out literally sleeping on couches, you know, selling stuff he printed himself. So 
yeah, a, a lot of us, when we do this, we start out small and uh, yeah, hopefully it picks up steam. Good. I hope it continues to pick up steam for you because this is super cool, super oh, exciting. I'm curious about a lot of things and, and I, I'm mostly curious right now about what you did in what I kind of want to call your pre-novel writing. So you, you kind of hinted that you did a whole bunch of script writing and ghost writing and technical writing and, and different. Can you tell me a little bit about how that felt to go through that and then um, any lessons that you learned about writing? You know, I started out just, you know, writing short stories just as a kid. And for years, that's what I did with short stories. And I never tried to send them out anywhere. I just did them for me. But I still circle back and I'll do short stories sometimes now. There's been uh, like a couple of years ago, there was this little online anthology that uh, I contributed a story to. And uh, so occasionally I like to circle back around to the short ones because it, it teaches brevity mm-hmm. and it teaches you to accomplish things with an economy of words and storytelling and characters. And that to me is very valuable because it's always a, re- a reminder to uh, it, it keeps me working to you know try to accomplish the, the story as efficiently as possible because just I tend to be wordy like the year of lightning my first draft was I think 112,000 words and print print uh, copy was like 87,000 oh gosh uh, black tempest the first draft was 152,000 and the print version is 107 wow uh, and it's not that I cut see a lot of scenes it's just that I tend to be wordy in the first draft because I'm kind of finding the picture myself you know but these short stories are great for teaching me to just accomplish it as quickly as possible. And I, I kind of take those lessons forward. Uh, for advertising, that was really a cool exercise because I worked for this. I live in Phoenix, and I worked for this uh, this little boutique agency here in Scottsdale. They did uh, do, they still do mainly uh, things for, like, resorts uh, and, uh, and places like that, like vacation areas. And so they would want these, like, either paragraphs of description for things for amenities or like snappy one-liners to go on ad copy uh, or to go on magazines and stuff. And so it, it was a good lesson in getting my head in a certain mood and in a certain creative space. Like uh, there's this one resort that is a restored old uh, hotel from the sixties and they made everything modern, but they kept that kind of sixties vibe to it. And so that was one of the jobs that I had. And so I thought, okay, I, I need to come up with some, you know, catchy little lines or things for this. And so I sat in front of my computer blasting the Ocean's Eleven soundtrack. (laughs) You know, just kind of trying to, in my head, in in that space, create the the vibe of, you know, a cool, like, swinging place where you'd be drinking a martini and uh, saying something clever. And and it worked. They actually liked what I came up with. (laughs) Um, So I do that now with, with all my books, with a lot of scenes. I have soundtracks for every book. Sometimes a character will have a uh, theme song. Sometimes a particular scene will have a song that to me helps me find the kind of the, the feel and the rhythm of it. Uh, so that's been super helpful. Uh, another thing I did, and this wasn't paid, it was just to get more experience because it was fun. Um, for a while, any friend of mine that I, that I had that wanted to sell something like on Craigslist, I would say, hey, let me write your ad. Uh, <laughs> and I would just write crazy, wacky stuff. And a lot of things sold because people laughed at the ads. <laughs> and, uh, and that was a good lesson in uh, embracing your weirdness and, uh, mm-hmm. and going with that. And, you know, when you seeing people respond to that, that I, I think that maybe subconsciously helped me choose the year of lightning because it was one of my least traditional type of ideas. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I wasn't afraid of going with that because I think – you know, how whatever your weirdness is, eventually you're going to find people who share it or appreciate it. So, yeah, th- those early years were really good for kind of sowing the seeds of, of being a real writer. I love that. I love the idea of embracing your weirdness. I think that that's really underutilized and undervalued by a lot of writers. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I talk a lot about finding your voice whenever new writers ask for advice about you know, what would you, you know, tell writers to do to do when they're trying to get started? I always tell them, take your time and find your voice, find your identity, because that's what's going to sell you. Do you have any tips for writers on how to find their voice? The first tip is one that I would hate if someone told me early on, so I always apologize for it, but it's don't rush, because you can't manufacture uh, a, a unique voice. Uh, and I always say, you know, 
experiment, you know, write lots of different things, challenge yourself, write things you wouldn't have thought you would, you would write in genres you wouldn't think you would write, read things in genres that you don't have much interest in and, you know, absorb things from a wider expanse of, of books and movies and games or whatever you like to consume because that all adds to your creative vocabulary. And you may end up finding things you really like in some very unlikely places. So that's a good start, I think. You may hear some scribbling sounds because I'm writing down the phrase creative vocabulary, oh. <laughs> which is the best thing that I've heard all day. And I absolutely oh. love this. And I'll make sure it goes into the show notes for today's episode. Awesome. And I will credit you with this awesome phrase. You talked a little bit about your, you know, working sort of before you published your novel. Are you still kind of working full time? Are you writing full time now? How do your days work out? Uh, I do have a day job now. Uh, if all goes according to plan, then at the end of the year, I won't. Ooh. Uh, that's what I'm shooting for. I, I, no one like out there in the, the, you know, Twitter sphere or any of that really hears about it because I, I tend not to, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it here, but uh, just in normal forums, I tend not to talk about day job stuff because mm -hmm. I feel like this is going to sound pretentious, but I mean it in the best way. I feel like it ruins the magic a little bit. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I remember um, when I was fairly new and, you know, just kind of establishing a presence on Twitter and Facebook. And there was a, a writer that I followed who, you know, I only ever knew as, as an author. And they one day were complaining a little bit just about day job woes and, you know, just, you know, just normal things that they were kind of stressful and, you know, working in a cubicle and this and that. And I remember feeling disappointed thinking, I really don't want to hear about your office job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to think of you as a writer, uh, which may not be fair, but I, that really hit home with me. And I thought, you know, uh, there's really no reason to be anything but a writer when I'm, when I'm in that mode of being a writer. So that tends to be what I, uh, anything I talk about online is, is, it's either just something goofy or funny or, or author centric. You know, that, that is such a great insight because, um, a few episodes ago, I talked about creating your personal brand as a writer and really, you know, we live in this cult of personality where if you're a writer, you're a writer with a capital W and that's how the public perceives you. And that's how you need to portray yourself everywhere. And if we, you know, sort of slip out of that character that we've created for ourselves, if we get quote unquote off brand, then it can be really harmful for fans. And so I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up with that concrete example. You know, just completely <clears throat> how I reacted. And so that's the lesson I took. It, it's funny. Um. I, Instagram was the last one I adopted, but I, I, I've ended up really enjoying it. But there's also family that follows me on there. And there was at one point an uncle, uh, this got to me through the grapevine, but an uncle remarked to my mother, he, he said, uh, you know, he really posts about his book a lot. Oh. <laughs> and I said, why don't you tell him if it wasn't for my book, I wouldn't have an Instagram. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, that's, that's why I'm on there. And I, I have fun with other stuff too. But, you know, I, I tend to use all the social media stuff, you know, for this. Kind of going off of that, um, and you don't have to answer this if this is too personal or uncomfortable to talk about, but are you planning to kind of support yourself on novel writing? That's the goal, or at least writing. Dude, uh, I mean, nice. I, I like writing all sorts of things. Um, in a heartbeat, I would jump on doing a screenplay. I loved doing that when I did them for the contests. Uh, I, I would say novels are my first love, but I, I can do a, a lot of stuff and, and enjoy it. I just like to write. In fact, I have, right when I got my book deal, I was designing a, a tabletop game. I was going to kickstart it. What? Really? Yeah, and it's 80% it's done. But it sat on the shelf for two years because it was either the game or my books. And the books got priority largely because I, that was the contract. <laughs> but what I'm hoping is that, you know, at the end of the year, hopefully, if I can get my situation where I want, then I can write some of the time and I can design this game as well, and, which I, I loved and was already in the in the um, in the stage of playtesting and was getting really good reactions. And uh, it's nice because I also got to design a game world and. There's, you know, six different play factions and I got to design, you know, a shared universe and, you know, stories and histories there. And I, uh, I'm actually taking something from what I did before. Uh, one of my earliest paid gigs as a writer 
is I, I helped develop the universe and the storyline for another tabletop game, actually. Oh. Uh, and the guys who were putting that together, they said, you know, we want to go a little deeper with the story here. Can you write us a series of short stories uh, set in the game world? And we'll put those in the handbook. And I did, and I had a blast. And so I thought, okay, with my own game, I definitely want to do the same thing. So, yeah, I want to do that at some point. I, you know, I just like to write. If I can write fun stuff, I'm on board. I love it. I'm also a huge D&D Pathfinder kind of person. And so oh. games and stories just always have a natural connection for me as well. Did you learn a lot about world building or did you bring knowledge that you already had about world building to working on uh, your game and then this other game? Uh, it was a combination. Um, uh, actually, comics taught me a lot, mm -hmm. uh, reading comics, uh, when I was doing that initial job. Uh, because uh, in, in that game as well, there were several different kind of factions that you could play as. So I had to think about, because it's that game was set quite a while in the future. So I had to think about, okay, these six factions, where are they now? But they all come from a common place. So I also had to kind of reverse engineer to where did they all begin? Mm -hmm. And how did they all splinter off into these six different factions? And then, you know, finding kind of the identities of the different factions and the styles and, uh, and then personal stories in between those that you could, you know, craft some short stories around looking at the kind of the shared worlds and the shared interconnected stories that comics have accomplished for years. That was a great lesson. And I thought, you know, I think I could do something like that. So it's kind of like a, a shared universe within a game. The lessons I learned writing that game, I, I definitely am bringing forward to this game. I love that world building isn't something that I've talked a lot about on this show. And I, I really appreciate you um, using the phrase reverse engineering, because I think that that is very overlooked, but also very, very key when you are creating a world, like seeing where you want it to be and then working backwards from there. Yeah, I agree. I'm curious to hear, when you thought about publishing your novel, did you think at all about self-publishing or was it just traditional publishing all the way? And how did that journey go? Uh, you know, I'm I'm not opposed to self-publishing at some point, but I'm also a fan of the traditional model, which, you know, of course, the tradi traditional model has its flaws and has its challenges. But ultimately, that's what I always wanted. I like having a partner in this. And that, that, that was very appealing to me. And just the traditional model has always been what I wanted to go for. Um, at some point, you know, later in the career, maybe I'll go hybrid. Uh, I don't really ever have the desire to just self-publish. If anything, maybe do smaller stuff. Uh, self-publishing, you know, in between book contracts, hopefully, um, <laughs> in an ideal world. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm certainly not opposed to it. I mean, there's been some great books that have come out of self-publishing. And, and I said, I know there, there can be flaws and frustrations in the traditional model because, I, you know, I've experienced them. It's tough. It, mm. it will test your resolve and your endurance for sure, especially if you're trying to sell something that is fairly unique because you'll get a lot of people say, the thing that I, I heard more than anything was, this is really good work, but I can't sell it, or I don't know what to do with it, or it doesn't fit our list. Or, you know, the, the shorthand for a lot of the rejections was, this is good work, but it doesn't, I don't see anything like this selling, so I don't think I can sell it. So I, I got a lot of rejections for the year of lightning, well over 100. And that's agents, editors, um, and, you know, I would say a, a couple of dozen, you know, had either partial or full, full requests and, uh, yeah, almost universally. Good work, but no thanks. Uh, which, after a couple of years, is uh, will test you. <laughs> wow. Oh, uh, my gosh. Yes. But I believed in it. And I, I, I knew what I said before. I, I was putting my money where my mouth is. I knew that there were people who would appreciate it because I knew I couldn't be the only one. <laughs> so, uh, And I had beta readers who enjoyed it. So I thought, I know there's a market for, for something like this, you know, that, that goes in between all the other stuff that, that gets released and is not as straightforward and that has, you know, it's not just action and it's not just mystery. It's not just sci-fi. It's got a little bit of everything plus a little romance. And so I just kept pushing uh, until finally I uh, grabbed the attention of this, this little boutique publishing house that uh, editor got what I was doing and really liked it. And the rest of the team agreed, and they were real, they were small but scrappy and real passionate about it. And I went from, you know, I had basic outlines and ideas for the whole trilogy, but I went from kind of trying to sell this one to them saying, hey, you said you have ideas for a trilogy. Why don't we just buy all three? What? That's awesome. <laughs> Which blew my mind, yeah. And I said, 
And I, I had kind of a moment that was like, you know, I had all these people for two years tell me that these would never sell, and I just sold three of them. So there was a, a satisfying moment there. Good. So yeah, that was uh, an exciting payoff for all the years working on it. Good. I'm glad that it ended that way. That's that's really good and really rewarding to hear. I know that a lot of writers are nervous about fitting into certain genres and being sellable. I kind of want to ask, without going into any spoilers, what was it that made it too unique or unsellable? Was it just the different mashup of genres all working together, or was it something else? Well, I'll give you a, a little description of the book. Uh, so it's the main character is actually two main characters. It's a twin boy and girl. I aged them at at 15 because I knew the challenges that I wanted them to have. So they're above middle grade, but they're, you know, also still kind of early on and, you know, a little young in in YA. It's fairly quippy, uh, you know, sort of almost Joss Whedon-ish in how the characters interact. But at the same time, there are times when it's creepy. There are times when it's scary, but there are also times when it's goofy. There's a little bit of romance. There's some action. There's a lot. uh, The two main characters, but there's a a large cast of other characters, including, uh, you know, other teenagers, uh, teachers, grandparents, all of whom have some part to play, you know, large or small in the story. And it's, you know, it's a little bit nerdy. It was a lot of the things that I loved I I threw in there and Mm -hmm. that I thought would be fun. And it's not a traditional story by any means. You know, it's, I've been told it's fairly hard to predict. Um, So it doesn't follow, I think, a lot of the story beats you would expect. So, yeah, I, I think it confounded a lot of agents and some editors, and they just weren't, I, I don't think they could envision where they would shelve it. And so they ended up just saying, well, I'll just, I, I don't think I need to spend the time trying to figure it out. See, that's interesting, because your description of the book makes me want to read it like a 100 times more now. Like, oh, it has adventure and sci-fi and nerdiness and quippiness and like, what brother and sister protagonists? Like, that's awesome. Well, thanks. And I, yeah. I knew there were people like you, yeah. <laughs> but, but nobody believed me <laughs> uh, when, when I would say, look, I, I know there's people out there like me who would enjoy something like this. And I had an early reader describe it as um, Monster House meets Back to the Future. And I, I would say it's a pretty good description. If you combine that with like a sci-fi version of like the Buffy squad, but with the other two as well, uh, it, it, I would say that you're probably close to describing the tone. Cool. Oh, see, I see. I love that. And I'm, I'm really glad that you kept believing in it. I'm really glad that you kept pushing it. You said over 100 rejections. Yeah. My gosh, I'm so glad that you did that. Of course, getting the contract was great. And the book deal itself was great. But the thing that actually felt the best was the validation of someone acknowledging, <laughs> yes, this is good enough to publish and I want to publish it. Yes. That felt amazing. And sort of uh, on that note, you know, people being afraid to sort of take on your book because they're worried maybe that it won't find an audience or won't sell. How did you go about building your readership then after or maybe during the publishing process? Well, I'm still doing it. I mean, really, my I've only been on the scene for just over a year. So I, I'm a, a newbie uh, in every sense of the word. I, I try some things online. You know, I'm still kind of figuring out how to do better outreach online. I, I think my strongest suit, my, my strongest skill set is doing live events, meeting people in person. Mm. You know, I'm I'm pretty decent, and I'm not really afraid of speaking in front of a crowd. So, uh, doing you know panels at comic cons, you know, kind of meeting people face to face, I just kind of present it to them, and then I, you know, it's not any kind of high pressure thing. If they're interested, great. Uh, you know, if not, that's that's fine too. And I love doing things like this podcast. I'm a huge fan of and. So I was I was super stoked that you wanted to have me on. Um, Heck yes. <laughs> and, I, you know, I'm still uh, really it kind of still in the baby stage trying to kind of get my voice out there. And um, it's it's a learning process every day. And, you know, there's leaps and bounds and then there's setbacks. There are times you feel like, OK, you know, people are hearing me. Mm-hmm. Then there's other times it's like you're shouting into the wind. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but it's you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun learning, seeing what works. You talked about you're selling a trilogy and you have these 20 to 30 ideas. Do you plan on, you know, you have a kind of like a game in the works. Do you plan on writing more novels to kind of fulfill those 20 to 30 other novel ideas? Or what's next for you, I guess? I probably have 40 now. (laughs) My uh, writing group calls me the idea factory. 
<laughs> that is a uh, good thing to be. Yeah, it, it's just, and it, I think it just comes from loving concepts and stories, and it's just the way my brain works. I can't remember a shopping list, but I can come up with a pretty good story, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I've got plans for some of them. There's there's some that I think definitely would make good novels. In fact, for my next project i think i have it narrowed down to two or three that i will choose between and i think a couple of them could probably become games i'm also working with this uh here in phoenix this little creative collective it's um writers and uh artists and uh, actors and and uh things and we've been working on uh scripts for like live table reads and like radio play style stuff oh yeah so what we've been doing up up until this point is sort of kind of just fan stuff, you know, like um, we did a redux of Star Wars episode one, but we wrote, rewrote the whole script the way we thought it should have been done <laughs> um, and did a live script read of that. There's, uh, we have a, a, a podcast series called To Prove a Villain that um, the first season just finished not long ago and we're, uh, and we actually just recorded season two. It's, um, uh, it's all, it takes place in comic book worlds. Like uh, season one was in the DC universe and, the story was a, um, a psychology student who gets kind of out of the blue a book deal for researching the criminal mind. And so she uh, works to score these brief interviews with different DC villains. Oh, cool. <clears throat> so, yeah, it was it was the interviews. And then uh, uh, season two takes place in the Marvel Universe, and that'll be out later this year. But we're also expanding into original stuff. The guy who is kind of the mastermind behind it and runs it uh, came to me recently and said, hey, I know you got tons of ideas. Why don't you when you have time, pick one and, you know, we'll adapt it into a, a radio play series for a podcast. Nice. Um, so I'm going to do that. You know, like I said, I just like to write. I definitely feel like uh, we're very similar in that way because I, I similarly always have about a billion projects going and Oh, I love that. I love all these projects you have on the horizon. If people are interested in sort of checking out a website or maybe purchasing a copy or 10 of your book, what should they do and where should they go? So um, my uh, my books are available uh, pretty much uh, anywhere books are sold, um, online or in stores. Uh, or if, uh, if someone has a, like an indie store in their area that they like to uh, uh, like to support, any of those stores, if if they want to buy through them, you can always request it and they can order it. If uh, they're an online person, you know Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Uh, my sec my sequel is being carried by Target as well. What uh, really? On online, sorry, Target online. That's kind of a big deal though. <laughs> Yeah, it was. So I, I ended up getting kind of a publisher upgrade because um, my original publisher in September, it was in danger of closing. And that was all very sudden. But then there's this uh, new group uh, called North Star Editions that had bought Flux and made that an imprint of them. Uh, that also, when they had heard what was happening with Jollyfish, which is, which is my publisher, came through and said, hey, we like what you're doing. Uh, and they bought uh, Jollyfish as an imprint as well. So uh, North Star has kind of a, is, it's a bigger machine. You know, it's more established and around longer and they have better outreach. And so book two is actually getting a much bigger publicity push, which is nice. Wow. And then hopefully that will boost sales of book one. Yeah, that would be That's, great. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, there were a number of months where book one wasn't even available because I don't think they could afford to print it, honestly. Wow. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's no no danger with that now, and there's a much wider release, yeah, which is uh, which is very nice. And so yeah, uh, they can uh, find the books pretty much wherever they look. They can order them anywhere. Uh, as far as finding me, uh, I'm on Facebook, facebook.com/slash Ryan Dalton Writes at i Ryan Dalton on uh, Twitter, uh, RyanDaltonWrites.com. I'm not on my website a ton right now, just because I'm I'm drafting and my. My uh, my deadline for book three is in May, so uh, I'm pretty much all book all the time right now. <laughs> or if someone just wants to talk, I mean, Ryan Dalton writes at gmail.com. I hope that folks get in touch with you. I hope that they buy copies of your books. And I hope that you keep doing this. I hope that you keep um, just putting your love of books and nerd culture and amazing things that cannot be categorized out into the world. I'm really oh, excited about what the future holds oh. for you. Well, thank you. Oh, and and I will say, and excuse me if this doesn't fit, but uh, yeah. I always make myself available to book clubs, writing groups, schools and libraries, you know, oh, kids yeah, yeah. Programs or book programs or anything. Anytime that like there's anyone who wants like an author to do a Skype session with a group, I'm happy to do that. 
Oh my gosh, yes. And if there's a way that I can call that out or link to that in today's show notes, I will definitely do that. Great. I appreciate that. Yay. Good. Oh my gosh. Yay. Connecting readers with authors. One thing that I love doing. Any last advice that you'd like to leave us with? You know, I, I think I, I said a lot of what my philosophy is, you know, be, you know, find your voice, be true to it and just, you know, keep going, be the best you can be. Eventually someone will see it and, you know, you'll be off and running then. Oh, I, I hope so. And I think that your story is such a testament to that. And I think that your words and advice today are going to inspire so many writers. So thank you for reaching out. Thank you for, for being on my show. This has been such a delight. Oh, I was very happy to do this. Thanks for <laughs> well, thank you, Ryan, once again. Um, have a great evening and, and please do keep in touch.